As you heard, I'm going to talk about climate change and health and run through some of the risks, some of the opportunities that we have in this space. And I look forward to the questions at the end. I'll start with a headline statement that climate change is already adversely affecting people's physical and mental health. As I go through the presentation, you'll see that more than 80, 85% of all the health risks of climate change are in children. Certainly in the United States, when you say climate change, people think about polar bears. We really want people to think about the children who are being affected today and will be affected in the future. The extent to which they're affected depends, of course, on our choices in terms of adaptation, mitigation, and managing residual risks. I know you're never supposed to put up a slide with this many words on it, and I do apologize for that. It's a summary of some of the findings from the human health chapter from the latest round of the IPCC. You can see in lighter blue the issues that we assessed in the chapter. I put this in because there are a broad range of climate sensitive health outcomes. So first of all, we refer to health outcomes and not diseases because many of the impacts that are being observed are not actually diseases. People suffering heart attacks, for example, in extreme heat events is not a disease. We did look at extreme events, food, water, vector-borne diseases, a quite wide range of issues. I'll speak a little bit more in a moment about mental health that's becoming much more important on our agenda. The bottom bullet is about health services. These are healthcare facilities. Many facilities around the world are in very vulnerable locations. I'm currently working in the Pacific where healthcare facilities are just a few meters from shorelines. They're already suffering during king tides, being inundated when there are typhoons, when there's other kinds of extreme events that occur. And I will not speak much more about that, but it is important to note that thinking about our health services, the ability to access those, obviously very important when you have a disease outbreak, and the importance of strengthening those as we've seen so intensely during COVID-19. I don't think that was supposed to be the next slide. Well, sorry, rearranged my slides. As those of you who work in climate change know there's a field in climate change called detection and attribution. More and more, there are detection and attribution studies for health. This is one of those studies. It was a modeling study that used information on heat-related mortality over the last couple of decades for over 700 locations in 43 countries. The overall assessment when pairing the understanding of the associations between high temperature and mortality and with one of the modeling efforts, one of the MIPS, Modeling Intercomparison Programs on Detection and Attribution, concluded that about 37% of heat-related mortality is caused by climate change. The attribution has been done. There's wide variability around the world. Some of you are going to be in the back and are not going to be able to read what the different countries are, but you can see the pattern and see the variability, which provides opportunities to think about why some countries are doing better and some countries are doing worse. But overall, this and a fair number of other studies have moved the health sector from talking about associations between temperature, precipitation patterns, extreme events, and health outcomes to be able to say with confidence that people are dying from climate change. And so I can speak to ministries and say, in fact, you have people who are dying from climate change. This is not a future issue. As you know, it's a current issue. Getting the health sector to understand this is a current issue has been a bit of a lift. There's lots we can do in terms of managing these climate sensitive health outcomes that are occurring today. For heat specifically, there's heat wave early warning and response systems. They are effective. They save lives. Essentially, nobody should die in a heat wave. There's a deep understanding of the physiology of how heat affects our bodies. 
There are many interventions that can be put in place to protect us during heat waves. One of the longer running and really, frankly, one of the better heat wave early warning systems is in England. Despite this, you can see on the right-hand side what happened last summer. You can see that there was over 3,000 excess deaths. During the big heat wave period in July, over 2,000 excess deaths. These are people who would not have died otherwise. So there's a lot that needs to be done to increase the effectiveness of these early warning systems to be able to manage the kinds of shifts we're seeing in our temperatures. These are figures from the Lancet Countdown based on a series, a heat and health series that was published a bit over a year ago. On the left is a set of graphics of what can be done at the level of the individual to protect themselves when temperatures are high. Not one of these involves air conditioning. There's lots of actions that people with understanding, with the appropriate knowledge can undertake themselves or caregivers can undertake just to make sure that people are protected, that that core body temperature doesn't rise too much. And they then can be protected during these periods of very high temperature and not see the spikes in hospitalizations, the spikes in preventable deaths. On the right-hand side are strategies that can be undertaken at the level of buildings and urban areas. In addition to the heat wave early warning and response system, communities are developing what are called heat action plans. And these take into account, how are we going to change our infrastructure over the next several decades as temperatures continue to rise and we have more heat waves? What kinds of changes can we make that both address the heat that's rising in our cities with these higher temperatures and with the urban heat island, but in addition to address the inequities that are driving much of the differential impacts we see on heat across populations? I live in the Pacific Northwest. You talk about heat, we think about wildfires. They come pretty much back to back. This shows you the association between what we call the air quality index. There's different kinds of indices used around the world. These are metrics of particle size. The air quality index typically is used to measure just straight air pollution, not specifically wildfire smoke. And it measures a particular particle size. The size is just the right size so that when you inhale it, it goes deep into your lungs, gets embedded in your lungs, and it's absorbed into your body. It's toxic, which is why you see these associations with higher levels of the air quality index with diabetes, lung, and heart disease. I also put this in because as you can see in the, the bottom bar, an air quality index over about 60 is unhealthy for anybody to breathe. A couple of weeks ago here in Seattle, the air quality index in my neighborhood was over 220, and that lasted for days. Last summer, there was communities in Los Angeles affected by wildfire smoke blowing in from wildfires around Los Angeles where the air quality index was over 750. When we had the wildfire smoke here in Seattle, we had the worst air quality in the world. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, what these short, intense exposures mean for human health, particularly for children and anyone who's got any kind of chronic lung disease. Another extreme event is flooding. These are some very interesting data following up on flooding that occurred in 2013 to 2014 in the UK. Very usefully in looking at how people were affected in terms of their mental health, the researchers separated out folks into those who lived in a residence that was not affected, those who lived in a residence that was disrupted, floodwaters came to the front door but didn't come in, and those who lived in a residence that was actually flooded. These are data for anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. For each set of these, the bar on the left is the first year of follow-up. 
then the second, and finally the third. You can see for both of these mental health challenges, the big increase in anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder in the first year after the flood. You can see as well that the prevalence comes down over three years, but does not go back to normal. These are important data illustrating the long-term mental health challenges of these very extreme events. There's nowhere in the world that's adequately prepared to handle these mental health challenges for long-term follow-up after extreme events. And of course, these events are not separate. The way our atmosphere is changing, how it's responding to the additional energy we're pumping into it, we're seeing more extreme events. These are some useful analyses, vulnerability mapping for British Columbia in Canada. These are maps they generated for the province looking at extreme heat, the sensitivity to that heat in terms of at the community level, what's a proportion of adults over the age of 65, for example, and metrics of how capable the community would be to handle very extreme heat waves like we experienced last year with the heat dome. They did this not just for heat, but also for flooding and sea level rise, for wildfire smoke, and also ground level ozone. Ozone is formed on clear cloudless days. The rate at which it's formed is temperature dependent. All else being equal, higher temperatures, more ozone. They then put these together to generate a map of these compound hazards for the province. This is very useful for policymakers to know where to prioritize. Where is it urgent and immediate that they start taking action to help protect the vulnerable populations within these communities? The human health sector is really taking up these kinds of approaches, and there'll be a lot more vulnerability mapping of compound hazards over the coming years. Those were all observations, giving an indication of the breadth and depth of the challenges that the health sector is facing with climate change. There's also projections for the same sets of hazards and exposures that I mentioned under observed impacts. And this just gives a real brief summary from the IPCC chapter. For those of you familiar with IPCC, particularly working group two, you'll recognize both of these figures the figure on the left shows projected temperature change under different combinations of the shared socioeconomic pathways and the representative concentration pathways and shows the projections out to 2100. And that's paired with a figure on the right. The figure on the right is what we call the burning embers. The burning embers have been used in IPCC reports for more than two decades. They're very well recognized by policymakers they find them very relevant. This is just for heat related mortality to keep the slide somewhat simpler. When you look at the figure on the right, the zero are, is pre-industrial temperatures. The Y axis then is increase in global surface temperature above pre-industrial. For each bar where the color is white, it means it's not possible scientifically to determine whether there's been a change in heat-related morbidity and mortality. There could have been no change. There could have been a change, but we don't have enough data. We, we just frankly don't know. When the color changes to yellow, it means that there has been an increase in heat-related morbidity and mortality, and that at least with medium confidence that that can be attributed to some extent to climate change. When the color turns to red, it means the risks are high. And when the color turns to purple, it means the risks are very high. You can see there's three embers here. The one on the left is for a world with limited adaptation. This is a world with high challenges to adaptation and mitigation. In the middle is a world that has incomplete adaptation. It's basically under shared socioeconomic pathway number two, where frankly, we do some things Okay, and some things we don't do quite as well. Everything gets a bit delayed. We kind of continue to muddle through. And the figure on the right is for a world aiming to sustainable development. 
The bars for incomplete and proactive adaptation are capped at the temperature projections in 2100 for that scenario. And so that's why you see the shorter embers for the ones on the right. Hopefully, as you look at this, what jumps out at you is what we know for all sectors, risk will continue to rise with increasing temperature change, but also the critical importance of both adaptation and mitigation, of thinking of what we can do to ensure that we don't get to four degrees C by 2100, and make sure that along the way, we're as proactive as possible about adaptation so we can protect and promote the health of as many people as possible. Another way to illustrate this are some projections for the United States, looking again at heat-related mortality towards the end of the century. As you look at these maps, the top row is projections with no adaptation in them. The bottom row includes adaptation. The left column, high emissions. The right column, low greenhouse gas emissions. And if you compare no adaptation and high emissions in the top left with adaptation and low emissions in the bottom right, you can see a significant difference in terms of the projected numbers of deaths. In the top left, the projected number of deaths, annual deaths by the end of the century is almost 100,000 additional people. And again, these are people who don't have to die from the heat. The numbers are much lower in the bottom right. But as you look at the scale in the middle, even with adaptation and even with low emissions, there'll still be additional people who could be dying from the heat unless we're much more active, particularly in terms of adaptation. These are what would be called residual risks in the field. And so we have to prepare not only for ramping up the resilience of our health systems, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, but increasing the ability of our health systems to handle these residual risks, the additional people who will be showing up at healthcare facilities. Moving on to vector-borne diseases, I won't go through all of this, but it's here to make the point that when we think about vector-borne diseases, diseases carried by mosquitoes and ticks, for example, temperature, and precipitation affect the development, the survival, and the reproduction of the mosquito or the tick. At the same time, temperature affects the replication of the pathogen within this mosquito or tick. So the modeling is somewhat complex because you have to take into account not only the changes that are ongoing in terms of our ecosystems and how that relates to where we see mosquitoes and ticks, but also when a pathogen is introduced into the mosquito or tick, how that temperature pattern then affects that replication in terms of the life cycle of the mosquito or the tick. Again, data from the United States. I'm looking specifically here at a mosquito called Aedes aegypti. It can carry dengue fever, chikungunya, Zika virus, and yellow fever. The virus in Europe is Aedes albopictus. There is lots of information about Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus and how they're changing their geographic range with warmer temperatures. Dengue fever is of particular concern. It's the most common mosquito-borne viral disease in the world. About 400 million people are affected every year. The map on the left in the beige color shows the, project, the projected, the modeled current distribution of Aedes aegypti. It's modeled because in the United States, vector control is at the state level, and there's different information available from different states. So this is modeled based on a lot of research that's been done about the environmental determinants of the mosquito. The red is projections towards the end of the century under high emissions of where it would be possible for that mosquito to be residing. And you can see a significant increase in the geographic range. If you are close enough and you look hard enough, you can see that there's some red around Seattle that will have an environment where we could have Aedes aegypti here. But it's not just having mosquito present. You have to have a summer that's long enough and hot enough that if you introduce, for example, dengue fever into the mosquito population, 
you can have transmission. Going back to, you have to understand the relationship between temperature and pathogen replication. In those circumstances, you can see a significant reduction in the expansion of the geographic range. So still an expansion of the geographic range looks like we'll be good in Seattle. Looks like won't have as many challenges in the West as are projected on the left. These projections were published in about 2016. A few years after these projections, breeding colonies of this mosquito were found in Toronto, Toledo, and Detroit. That's outside the projections for the suitability on the left, although Toronto is part, not Toronto, Toledo is part of the projections on the left. But like so many fields, this is suggesting that we're under projecting the risks, we're underestimating the challenges we're going to face. Once you find breeding colonies of this mosquito in a location, it's almost impossible to eradicate. The mosquito is 100% adapted to human environments. It'll fly a kilometer or more to bite a human over everybody else. It breeds in the water in the bottom of a flower pot. I've not done this. Entomologist colleagues have gone into sewer systems and apparently there's millions of mosquitoes in sewer systems. It's warm, it's moist, it's a perfect environment for mosquitoes. And the 80s take advantage of that. So it's not a question of if Seattle's ever gonna see dengue fever this century, it's a question of when it could. Of course, it's not just climate change, it's other factors as well. A particularly important one is now that we're coming out of COVID-19, all the people getting on airplanes. These are data from the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, looking at the airport final destination of international travelers into Europe in two different periods from countries that are endemic for dengue. This is being used by vector control programs in Europe to think about where they need to set up surveillance because it's around these airports that you could first start to see transmission of dengue fever. And just like with heat, there's many possibilities for developing early warning systems. Population health has done a relatively poor job on taking advantage of all the environmental information that's available. This is obviously a detailed slide and I'm not gonna go through it, but it does highlight that there are lots of possibilities Singapore, for example, has got the best dengue control program in the world. It also regularly has outbreaks of dengue fever and developed an early warning system that gives them four months notice of when they could have a, an outbreak. That's four months to warn pregnant women, four months to clean up breeding sites, four months to get everything in place because you can't alter those environmental conditions, but you don't have to have an outbreak if your health system is prepared. There are long lists of adaptation options. All the health concerns of a changing climate are current problems. All of the issues that I've raised, there are control programs somewhere around the world. May not be where they're needed, may not have the right seasonality, but there is a strong base from which to build. The most effective option is really strengthening the resilience of our health systems. Again, thinking about what, what happened under COVID. I'm not going to go through the others. We can talk about those later if you'd like. I would like to point out at the bottom, the major constraint is limited investment. When you look at the adaptation funds under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, less than half of 1% has gone to health. People are already suffering and dying from climate change, and the funds are not investing in adaptation options to help protect populations, particularly in countries that are most vulnerable. Just as in other sectors, it's very important for there to be national adaptation plans for health. There's national adaptation plans for agriculture, water, infrastructure, energy, and other issues. The World Health Organization every other year surveys all of their member states, about 200 countries. The survey last year, only about 91 countries reported, and only half of those had some kind of strategy or plan in place and less than a quarter felt like they had the resources they needed to begin implementing the adaptation that's so urgently needed. I wanna move on to something that 
we have known for quite some time in health, but have failed to get the message out very clearly. And that is when you look at the major approaches for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, all of them have significant benefits for health. Millions of people die needlessly every year from exposure to air pollution. Much of that air pollution can come from coal-fired power plants. You reduce emissions from coal-fired power plants, you start saving lives. Transportation is a major source of emissions in most of the high-income countries. Obviously important to reduce the emissions from cars, buses, trucks, etc. And one way to do that is to get people out walking and biking. People walk and bike, they lose weight, their blood pressure goes down, they have better mental health. And it's possible for both the coal-fired power plant, outdoor air pollution, for transportation, to start quantifying the benefits for health. How many avoided hospitalizations? How many avoided premature deaths? And when the value of those is estimated, the sum total is of the same order of magnitude, if not larger than the cost of mitigation. Mitigation could pay for itself in terms of the health benefits. A third major, major category is diet. And as many of you in the room work on, it's important to reduce the amount of emissions from, from livestock. And getting people to eat only as much red meat as their doctor recommends, again, benefits for the climate, benefits for health. And the numbers suggest we really should be emphasizing these health benefits that they can be motivating for people to take action on emissions reductions. One example, again, from the United States is in the Northeast of the United States, an initiative to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This looks only at child health outcomes over a five-year period in the counties that are colored the darkest green, the cumulative health benefits in these counties were up to almost $22 million. Again, the numbers are very large, and we need to get these messages out more clearly. Another mis message is mitigation can be fun. I've been really taken with these Dutch bike buses that kids get in these buses and bike to school instead of giving into a large school bus, which of course has lots of emissions from the diesel that it burns. So getting out not only the benefits for health, but also we can enjoy these changeovers in our emissions. I'll sum with what came out from the 1.5 report, a reminder that I'm sure you all know that every bit of warming matters, every year counts, and every choice matters. Thank you very much, and I hope I left time for questions.